and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Today we feature another segment of our ongoing series with the Vermont Cancer Center of the University of Vermont and Fletcher Allen Healthcare. The 21st century has brought enormous advances in medicine and technology. Today we're going to learn about the merging of those two areas, the application of computer technology to the management of biological information. Joining me are two members of the Vermont Cancer Center, Julie Dragon and Jeff Bond. Dr. Bond is a professor of microbiology and molecular genetics in UVM's College of Medicine, and Dr. Dragon is a research associate in the same department. Welcome to both of you. Now this is kind of a complicated scientific arena. Maybe we could start by giving sort of an overview of microbiology and molecular genetics. Well, you said the key word, Judy, when you said merging. Mm -hmm. and we're really on the molecular genetics side of the department, but the departments at UVM all work together. UVM is really strikingly uh, well, doing well in that area in collaborative research. So while we work in molecular genetics, uh, we use that in application to diseases like cancer. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's led to a new field called bioinformatics. And what is that? Yeah, so the General definition, anything that involves applications of informatics or statistics in the biological sciences is bioinformatics, mm -hmm. but that's probably not terribly mm -hmm. helpful. <laughs> the deal is that instruments now generate a lot more information than any one researcher or physician mm -hmm. can remember, not to mention use in decision making. Right. Informatics side helps store and retrieve when you need it, the right information. Statistics summarizes that large amount of information in a way that helps you make a decision. And one of the most exciting applications that we are involved in is in clinical decision making. So the information there is what's in a cancer tumor genome in terms of DNA sequence, mm -hmm. and the decision is what drug do we give the patient. But what we do, uh, a lot of people probably didn't realize was a job right. <laughs> between the tumor biopsy and the clinical decision. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, <coughs> and <sighs> you take a look at this information. You have this information in front of you, and it's like a sort of a road map to what's mm -hmm. happening in the particular cell and in the tumor. Mm -hmm. And that, and by looking at that, you can figure out where the abnormality is, <coughs> and then with that information, the doctors can maybe figure out <coughs> how to treat that abnormality. Yeah. How, to, how to design treatments specifically for a patient that are most likely to be effective with that patient. And, and to, to reemphasize the point that Jeff was making, it's the modern technology has allowed us to make these, these huge numbers of measurements. So we're not just basing decisions on one test here, one test there. We're looking at their entire DNA sequence and saying, okay, what is the big picture here? Yeah, so if I could walk you through for, to the personalized medicine decision mm -hmm. through a number of concepts, and okay. I brought some slides. Okay, let's take a look. So I want to take you first through the idea of a gene, mm -hmm. a genome, systems biology, and then mutations. Okay. So a gene, you've probably heard, carries information. Information gets stored in a gene. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, a recipe. If a, a gene and a recipe might be an ingredient, salt. OK. So a genome, you see now in medicine, ohm, the suffix ohm getting tagged onto lots of things. Gene becomes genome. Protein becomes proteome, and so forth. The suffix refers to a collection of things. So if a gene is an ingredient, the genome is the collection of ingredients, every ingredient in the recipe. Mm -hmm. Now this might not seem brilliant to anyone who's baked a cake, because <laughs> of course, before you bake the cake, you wouldn't go to the grocery store without thinking of the collection right. of ingredients. But actually in biology, we didn't have the technology. When I was in graduate school, we had no idea what was in the genome. Oh, okay. And estimates of the number of genes differed by a factor of 10, from 20 genes to nearly 200,000, 20,000 genes to 200,000 genes. So, but uh, like a recipe, the genome is not simply just a collection of genes. Recipe has structure. For example, in baking the cake, 
you'd have the batter and you'd have the frosting. Mm -hmm. And so you'd break it down into components. Similarly, the cell has its genes coordinating in different functions. They repair the DNA that gets damaged. They copy the DNA. They listen for signals from outside the cell telling them to divide, or they listen from signals outside the cell telling them not to divide. And so in addition to organization, there's amounts, actually, how much salt. This is a key mm -hmm. thing. And one of the important early personalized medicine observations was the amount of something called the estrogen receptor. This is in the 70s. Elwood Jensen pioneered this work looked at cancers and cancers that had estrogen receptor, which is a target of a drug, anti-estrogens. People who had that molecular marker tended to respond to anti-estrogen therapies. So, <clears throat> and now, so expression is what we refer to as the amount that these genes mm -hmm. are expressed. So, and then action, again, the batter and the frosting are not just two different components, they have a relationship. The frosting goes on the cake and mm -hmm. the recipe includes the action of putting it on the cake. And similarly, uh, we need to reflect those. And so the perspective is now that of biological systems, not just thinking of people as bags of genes. And when we represent them, for example, we color the genes. The genes might be colored red if they're more expressed in a cell, green if they're less expressed, and they have relationships between them. If one gene turns another on, then we put an arrow between them. And so in the slide, we show a biological system that yeah. has red and green genes expressed more or less and lines between them. And, and so this slide yeah. is actually from work we were involved in that uh, involved combination therapies for treating cells. So <clears throat> cancer, though, is a disease of spelling errors. So now the information in the genome, genomes like recipes get damaged, repaired, and copied. So the genome, uh, if it gets errors introduced, for example, as I was saying earlier, the cells listen for signals to mm -hmm. divide or not to divide. An, a mute spelling error can cause the cell to think it's getting a signal to divide, mm -hmm. or it can get an error which makes it deaf to signals that say, don't divide. So essentially one of our most important roles is as spell checkers. And, and so you're I'm, looking for something that's out of order, something that doesn't belong. That's exactly, exactly. right. Mm -hmm. Yep, and our DNA between us, we probably have one in a thousand new bases in our letters in our genome is different, but we have to decide which of those, as you say, is out of line, is wrong. And for everybody this can be different. That's exactly yes. right. So when we sequence a tumor, we also sequence some normal tissue. So we want to see what spelling changes got introduced in the tumor by, compared, by comparison with the normal tissue. Mm -hmm. And so that brings us to personalized medicine, mm -hmm. which is what you're going to talk about, Julie. Yes, exactly. <coughs> so we're looking for these errors mm -hmm. in, in genetic sequence and which errors have an effect and which errors don't. As you might uh, no, using the analogy of a spell checker, you can introduce an error into a word and still interpret the sentence correctly. Right. Because we, we understand <coughs> sentence structure. Mm -hmm. But you could also introduce an error into a word and then misinterpret the sentence. Right. So we're looking for those mutations that have a downstream effect on health. And so you can tell then that <coughs> that difference mm -hmm. is what's affecting the tumor in the body which means it's easier if you can find that one thing to target it. Exactly. The evidence is building that there are these mutations that are called driver mm -hmm. mutations mm -hmm. that, that drive cells to become more cancerous. And we are looking for what are called actionable mutations, mutations for which we now have drugs that will target those errors. And we can subdivide patients they may have the same cancer, but maybe one has more aggressive type of cancer and one has a less aggressive type of cancer. One will respond to one type of drug and one will respond better to another type of drug based on that genetic profile that each individual has. And so what does this mean for the patient? This means that 
the <coughs> efficacy of treatment will be higher. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this, there was a recent study um, in, where a group demonstrated in lung cancer patients that by looking at a, a set of 10 genes that are known to be cancer driving genes, uh, they were able to increase uh, uh, survival rate amongst these patients by 64% by tailoring their treatments based on their particular genetic mutation profile. So while one individual with the same cancer might need one kind of treatment, the person sitting next to them with the exact same kind of cancer wouldn't. Right, maybe their mutation that's driving their cancer is in a, a different gene. So they would receive a different treatment. It seems to me this is a huge tool for cancer doctors and patients. Definitely. It, it demonstrated success beginning in the 70s, the 80s. We've had more and more decision rules to our arsenal. And now with large genomic projects, we expect to be adding rules at a much higher rate, covering a much higher percentage of the patient population. For some cancers, lung adenocarcinomas, we have decision rules that cover 60 plus percent of the population. Melanoma, similarly, well over half. For other cancers, we're down in the 10 to 15 percent range, and the active area of research is in developing new rules. Mm -hmm. And so tell me a little bit about UVM's involvement in this personalized medicine. You were saying, we were talking earlier about um, different departments and, and sort of separate departments, but it really sounds like UVM has figured out a way to bring all the best of these together to create even more, you know, departments, if you will. One, one of the things about bioinformatics as a field is that it, it is very interdisciplinary. And it's, it's made it somewhat challenging, but it it's, it's, um, goes along with the direction that science is going in now, which is very collaborative. When you look at papers being published now, there are hundreds of authors. It's not so much the old model where one lab is sort of isolated by themselves and they do their thing and they mm -hmm. publish their results. These are huge collaborations and we sort of span the clinic, the research lab, um, the computer lab. Yeah, and, and for example, uh, basic science research, we integrate x-ray crystallography. So the you might ask, what's the language? If this is information encoding, mm -hmm. what reads this language? Right. If you think of you know, a recipe, a person reads it, an MP3 file, file an audio player plays it, what well, reads the genome? So there's a Nobel Prize in 1972, Christian Anfinson, and what he did was, he, it was known at the time that DNA gets translated into protein, he showed that proteins actually fold themselves. And so, in fact, the laws of physics interpret the genome in that sense. So we work with Sylvie Dublier at UVM, mm -hmm. a world-famous crystallographer, and Susan Wallace, world-famous expert in DNA repair, and we try to understand human genetic variation in the context of these protein structures that are responsible for fixing DNA damages and understanding the impact of those on human health. We're also involved in a neuroblastoma clinical trial out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, the NMTRC Neuroblastoma Medulloblastoma Translational Research Consortium, where we play this spell checking and decision rules role. And so in the future, what do you see the role of, of this particular um, research doing for folks? Uh, for folks here in Vermont, I think they'll be seeing a lot more molecular diagnostic tests They'll be seeing targeted therapies rather than traditional chemotherapies, therapies which fewer side effects and are more tailored to their precise cancer, as you said earlier. People sitting next to each other uh, will respond differently to different drugs. So I think it's gonna be better treatments with fewer side effects. Mm -hmm. well, that's exciting news right here in Vermont. Oh yes. Absolutely. And so um, I just want to thank you for coming in and talking about this. It's, it sounded a little overwhelming at first when I was going over the information, mm -hmm. but it's really um, very unusual research. And I know that um, there are a lot of students who want to be a part of this. Definitely. It's a very popular field right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me today. Thanks thank for you. having us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.